आज हमारे साथ में सलवाटोरे बगोने जी हैं जो ऑस्ट्रेलिया में रहते हैं ऑस्ट्रेलिया में एसोसिएट प्रोफेसर हैं सिडनी यूनिवर्सिटी में लेकिन वो अमेरिकन है वैसे ऑस्ट्रेलिया में रहते हैं लेकिन मैं कहूँगा कि उनका जो दिल है वो शायद भारत से जुड़ गया है भारत से उनकी शायद मोहब्बत हो गई होगी इसके बारे में उनसे मैं बात करूँगा पहला उनका परिचय ये है कि वो एक संस्था चला रहे हैं जिसका नाम है इंडियन सेंचुरी राउंड टेबल लिमिटेड जिसके वो प्रेसिडेंट चेयरमैन भी हैं इसके बारे में बात करेंगे कैसे वो हमारे इस कॉज को जो हम लोग हमारा भी कॉज उसके साथ में मिल सकते हैं और हमारे श्रोता उनके साथ में कैसे जुड़ सकते हैं एंड ही हैज़ पार्टिसिपेटेड इन इंडियन टुडे कॉन्क्लेव इज वाल और उन्होंने पीएचडी ली है जॉन हॉपकिन हॉपकिंस यूनिवर्सिटी इन 2003 तो आप उनकी उम्र का भी लगा सकते हैं लेकिन वो काफ़ी यंग हैं काफ़ी वाइब्रेंट हैं एंड uh, uh, जो मैंने विकिपीडिया पे सर्च करा है उसमें ही इज़ अ फॉलोअर ऑफ ट्रम्प एंड एज पर विकिपीडिया हम उनसे क्वेश्चन भी पूछेंगे बाद में ही कंसीडर वाइडन एज ए डेंजर फॉर डेमोक्रेसी लेकिन वो हम अभी बाद में करेंगे उनसे बात में ही हैज एसोसिएटेड विद रशियन इंटरनेशनल काउंसिल से एंड इंडियन सॉरी रशियन इंटरनेशनल अफेयर काउंसिल से एंड एज ए सेड कि उन्होंने वो ही इज़ प्रोफेसर एसोसिएट प्रोफेसर इन सिडनी यूनिवर्सिटी एंड ही हैज रिटन सेवन बुक्स एंड ही इज ए सोशलॉजिस्ट एज वाल सो सलोटे ने आपका दर्पण प्रोग्राम में बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद यू आर वेलकम मिसर बबोने सलवोटोरे वुड यू लाइक मी टू कॉल यू मिस्टर बबोने और सलवोटोरे फर्स्ट दान यवान दैट्स बी द एंड ऑफ माय हिंदी एंड 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 प्लीज कॉल मी सलवोटोर दो आई शुड से दैट यू कैन रियली ट्रस्ट व्हाट यू रीड ऑन विकिपीडिया विकिपीडिया मेक्स मी आउट टू बी अ रशियन puppet uh trump supporter condemning biden uh, all of that is very selective uh very quoting selective. by wikipedia I, I editors, so, it, yes, yeah there's been a very i mean as with anything in the internet there's been a very clear campaign on wikipedia to try to discredit me and they seem to believe that calling me a trump supporter is a way of discrediting me so they can call me whatever actually, they like I, I was surprised actually when they when uh, they, they have one sentence saying that um you appreciated the agitation they happen in, in on congress uh hell uh, what do you call uh, the january 6 yeah yeah. yeah yeah the january 6 protest and they, and you said no it was peaceful and i was very because i know you and i thought how can it be possible that you can say something like that but anyhow i, I will uh, let um, um when you've written more than 400 going on 500 opinion articles yeah. when you've got more than 500 opinion articles it's uh it's it, It's very easy to find something you've said yeah. that you can take out of context and make yeah. sound like what yeah. you want. Uh but I promise you my views are very conventional. They've been published in most of the leading yeah. journals in the world, so the the Foreign Affairs magazine, uh, Foreign Policy magazine, Forbes, uh and I've written for the Sydney Morning Herald and the Australian here yeah. in Australia. These are very mainstream publications. And if yeah. you want to cherry pick something of out course, of the Sydney of Morning Herald to make me look like a monster, of course you can find something, but <laughs> I encourage people to take this, those links in Wikipedia and go yeah. back to the original. Hopefully sources. after today's interview. Same has happened in India. So the, oh, the, of course, the kind of, of cherry pick Uh, uh, course, you know, cherry picked up, uh, comments I've seen in India. I've been through it all before on Wikipedia and yeah. in the U.S. as well. Really, so um, so Lord, let's start with your uh, uh, this uh, new um, organization, uh, Indian Century Roundtable Limited. Please tell us more about uh, to our uh, listeners. I've been working with members of the Indian Australian diaspora including especially Pranav Agarwal. Uh we have put together this organization called the Indian Century Round Table. The idea is to have a think tank that is focused on India but facing the west by which we mean that we want to take knowledge about India and bring it to western 
audiences. The level of knowledge about India, and especially about Indian politics in the West, is extremely low, with the result that a few shrill opinions, you know, a few people can, again, cherry pick something and put mm. it on Wikipedia to shape the world's view of India when, in fact, there's much more there. There's much more to the story. And what we want to bring is the rest of the story. We want to present a purely factual, I stress that, a purely factual account of India in the West. Uh, that's really lacking. I mean, if I could put this in perspective, yeah. uh, almost all of American opinion on India comes from three columnists, one with the Washington Post, one with the Wall Street Journal, and one with the New York Times. Yeah. These three columnists shape the entire American opinion of what's going on in India and Indian politics. Wow. And of course, all three are from South Asia. You know, two are Indian, one is Afghan. And they. You know, it's only through the lens of these three people that all of America sees India. Well, what we'd like to do is have an authoritative, factual account of India in English on a Western website. We're not particularly an Australian organization. We are planning to be a global organization, uh, simply to present the facts on India. So, um, uh, if I may say, when you say about factual part, what exactly you are saying these people are interpreting the fact differently, or you are saying they are just making everything as opinion, they totally, are, do, totally disregarding the fact. Very often we see opinion presented as yeah. fact. And that's inevitable in the political world because we can't know the truth. Uh, so for example, there have been debates about the independence of the Electoral Commission of India. In India, it seems very clear that the vast majority of people view the Electoral Commission of India as a highly reputable, highly independent, autonomous body that is almost beyond reproach. There have been some minor, minor criticisms of the Electoral Commission of India, but they're very small. Yet, if you read Western coverage, oh, you will find that the Electoral Commission of India is no longer an autonomous organization. It's come completely under the control of the current government of India. Now, wow. that narrative is not based in fact, but it is a fact mm. judgment. That is, it is a fact narrative that experts who believe this about the Electoral Commission of India present their views as fact. Now, of course, we can't know the facts of the matter. No one knows if the Electoral Commission of India really is independent. We all hope that it is. We all trust that it is, but we can't actually know. But when an expert writes in the Wall Street Journal or the Washington Post that you know concerns have been raised about the independence of the Electoral Commission of India, that's technically a fact. I mean, a concern is always raised, but that is implying a much worse situation than is real. Now, I could take that tiny example about the Electoral Commission of India, and I could apply it. I mean, it has been said that Narendra Modi's BJP is a fascist political party. I could say comparisons have been made between Narendra Modi and Adolf Hitler. Now, that would be a fact. The comparisons have been made. The comparisons are ridiculous, <laughs> you know, and that's that's what doesn't get into the narrative in the West. The fact that these comparisons, these sort of shrill statements about India, have no real basis in the factual reality of Indian politics. Yeah, uh, thanks. Uh, actually, um, the way I'm looking at you are using this uh, organization, um, Indian Century Roundtable Limited to bring the factual part, not the perspective, the just bare fact, so that people can really make their own opinion and then make a decision about India. And exactly. Indian so our, our first paper, which will be released March 1st, will be on the Rise of Democracy Institute democracy rankings. And it'll be a complete uh, unpacking of how VDEM works and how is it possible that India, a country that's been a democracy for 75 years, that India is ranked 100th in the world for the quality of its democracy. And when VDEM ranks India 100th in the world, that's 100th in the world among all countries. And remember, there are 40 or 50 countries in the world that have no democracy at all, which means that among the actual countries in the world that hold elections, India is ranked one of the very worst in the entire world. Really? Now, I don't, I don't think that's realistic. And what I go through in the paper, the paper's already written, it'll be published March 1st. That'll be the first publication of the Indian Century Roundtable. What it will do is explain how did VDEM come to that conclusion. Wow. And it will show the, the serious shortcomings in VDEM's analytical strategy. So this is what I want to do with the Indian Century Roundtable. I want to bring out factual analysis. This paper is not my own evaluation of Indian uh -huh. democracy. It's a factual analysis of how is it 
that a country that has 75 years of free and fair elections can be rated on some electoral metrics below Hong Kong, <laughs> substantially <laughs> below Hong Kong. I mean, VDEM actually rates Hong Kong, uh, rates India below Hong Kong and Vietnam for free and fair elections. When Hong Kong's ruled by communist uh, just, China and Vietnam's ruled by a one-party uh, uh, dictatorship. Just for my, but, yeah, sorry, Salvatore, if I can just, uh, yeah. just for my curiosity, are these people are totally blind? No, so, to totally, and, they don't, and, and this is why I keep emphasizing the work of the Indian Century Roundtable will be entirely factual. What I do in the paper is explain how their methodology resulted exactly. in this deeply flawed conclusion. And I show where are the problems specifically wow. in their statistical methods that result in this conclusion. Okay, so you will assess their methodology as well, how they... I will to... simply give a factual account yeah. of their methodology wow. showing how is it possible that this could happen. Similarly, we're commissioning work on the uh, Adhar system. We'd like a factual account of, you know, again, not trying to evaluate is this good or bad for India? Do we agree or disagree with the exactly. system? We just want to know how does the system work? How is it possible that uh, how is it possible that India has reconfigured the delivery of direct benefit transfer? How has Aadhaar been used to do that? How does it compare with other national ID systems? Uh, and, you know, again, giving a purely factual account of the system. We'd like to do very factual work on Kashmir, uh, one area where it's, you know, feelings run very high on all sides, the yeah. status of Kashmir. It is impossible on the Internet today to find the simple facts about the status of Kashmir, about yeah. Pakistan occupied Kashmir, about China occupied Kashmir, about India administered Kashmir, and to get an account of who has troops where, what those troops are doing, wow. what's the status of civil rights in India and Kashmir, as well as in Pakistan occupied Kashmir, and the lack, complete lack of civil rights in Chinese occupied yeah. Kashmir. Yeah. Uh, what is the status in international law of this? You know, you'll notice I've said Pakistan occupied versus Indian administered, and that's because the status in international law yeah. is that Kashmir is a territory of India, but it has not, the status has not been fully resolved. So I say, I don't say India is Kashmir. <laughs> that you may believe Kashmir is Indian. I, I, you know, I'm being very careful in international course, law. Kashmir is Indian administered, but it's Pakistan and Chinese occupied. Okay. And again, we'll try to give a purely factual account without politics. And I'm very confident that Indians will, that India will benefit from a factual account yeah. of India. It may not make all Indians happy to hear the facts. There are negative but facts. If I may India. actually add up, it will benefit yeah. anyone because anything which based on lie is not going to help anyone. The, the decision um, any government will make on the opinion or the wrong fact, it will harm the relationship. It will harm that country as well. It's not good for anyone. Suppose tomorrow Washington Post or New York Times, they come up with this story. Now, if I can bring this one uh, uh, aspect which is happening now, Adani, you might have heard of sure. Adani Group. This one uh, research um, um, is called Heidelberg Research in uh, America. They publish a, a report. Everybody knows they are short seller. Yes. Everybody knows how they prepare. The three people, three, four people concluded that part. This is regarding the report generated by audit report I'm talking about, the big four accounting firm in the world. And they are American ones. So they are, it means this research is, is good in comparison to all the audit report, all the investigation, all the bank, they do due diligence. It means everybody is wrong. This research paper who did uh, this research and, and now people around the world have lost around 80% of their money. It is fair that wrong perception, wrong opinion lead to this conclusion that people lose real money. I think it is not fair. Look, I'm neither a financial advisor nor a forensic accountant, so I can't tell you the truth behind the Hindenburg report. I can point out that they are obviously a, a short-selling firm, that is, they are a hedge fund that short sell stock, meaning that they make bets against stocks and then they publish reports trying to talk the stock down. Uh, now, 
if the Adani Group stocks were substantially undervalued, it would be very difficult to talk them down. Is it possible that they have been overvalued? Of course it's possible. There's been a big bull market. There's been a big run up in the stock exactly. price of Adani exactly. Group. So it, was Adani stock ready for a downward correction? Again, I'm not, an, uh, no, I, I, I'm not a, a funds course. manager, but that doesn't seem potentially surprising to me. What, what's surprising about the Hindenburg report is, first of all, that it's named the group is named Hindenburg, which of course is is an allusion to the uh, the, the German uh, dirigible that uh, b yeah. burst into flames and crashed to the ground. So they're they're almost saying what we are is a group that wants things to burst into flames and crash to the ground. But what's really surprising is people have taken it seriously. That is a group of investors who've publicly said we are trying to reduce the value of Adani stock, and then issued a report saying why they you know why they think people should sell Adani stock that the stock price has responded to that I think is, is quite surprising because the they have been very transparent they're forced to be transparent by US securities regulation about exactly. the motives behind their report now I can't talk to the actual but, factuality but, of their um, report I, I'm not a forensic accountant yeah. uh, so Salvatore, it's uh, coming back to your point, now it has created so much um, issue between um, real investors and the national um, feeling in India. What people are saying, number one, because this is Asian um, uh, person who grew to a level second or third in the world as right. a wealthiest person, they could not tolerate the so-called Western people. They could not tolerate that part. And they had to do anything possible to reduce. This is number one. Number two, election is coming in India in 2024. And what they are saying is uh, um, because uh, he's um, a supporter of uh, BJP and, and the Modi, if uh, we can evaporate the money part, it will um, uh, impact on uh, and uh, BJP might lose. Mm -hmm. This is the second part they are trying to do. Um, third part is uh, they are saying there's a one... Uh, um, like Rajiv Sardesai, he had there's another guy called Ravish Kumar. He went to um, uh, this uh, research uh, body in America for seven times, and he whatever he gave the input and how we can do that part. But look at um, the situ situation here. Yesterday only we had a report. Modi got 78 percent rating in India. The whole effort, whatever. Well, let's talk about Hindenburg first and Modi second. Look, I, I don't think that these concerns, with apologies, I don't think they're very credible. Uh, I, I don't think anyone in America really is aware of who Gautam Adani is, and certainly the, the Hindenburg's motivation is not that they're racist and upset that a, an Asian is the richest man in the world. Their, their motivation is making money. They, they saw an opportunity to hit Adani and to make money exactly. by doing so. Now, they may be taking advantage of low, relatively no, low knowledge among Western investors mm. of the Adani group. So if people know very little about a company and a negative report comes out, they may run away because they don't know who to trust. Exactly. And so they trust the Hindenburg report. But I don't think that's anything about, but, uh, that's anything uh, no, racially I'm, motivated. I'm, I'm talking about what is the perception in India. Oh, I'm, I'm sure that's so, a perception, so, but I think, so that's, I, I think this, that this perception is, is simply false. Exactly. Uh, but what happens is this, uh, this is what, these are the consequences of this wrong no, thing. Look, I, I always encourage people to see things from the other side. So let's, ima let's imagine you're an American investor. You know very little about India. You've heard of <laughs> Gautam Adani, and you've heard that he's, uh, he's very rich and that he's risen very rapidly. Now an American hedge fund comes along and says, Oh, there's there's uh, shady dealings here, and the the profits are misstated. Now you're an American fund manager. You're not a deep expert on India, Indian politics, Indian <laughs> business. You just have a part part yeah. of your fund, maybe five percent of your fund allocated to India, and maybe one percent of that is in Adani companies. What do you do? Well, to be cautious, perhaps you sell that Adani yeah, stock, I'm right? Close. Now that's the kind of mechanism that is occurring. Adani and India, Adani in particular and India in general are operating in a low information environment in the West. If a similar short seller had issued a report about Google or Apple, there would have been thousands of alternative opinions being expressed 
on both sides, there would have been a lot of detailed analysis around, is this report right or wrong? When it comes to Adani, there's so little knowledge in the West. This is probably the first time most American investors had ever heard of Adani. <laughs> right, probably the first time. So when you're in a low information environment, yeah, yeah, that yeah, kind of exactly. one-off yeah. job can have a big impact. Yeah. Now, I really doubt this has anything to do with the election. The election's more than a year away. If someone really wanted yeah. to make this about an election, yeah. I've said this not only with the Hindenburg report, but also with the BBC yeah. documentary. I'm sure <laughs> we'll talk, talk about, about that both of that. these would have come out <laughs> next year if exactly. they were meant to affect exactly. the election. So, Salvatore, we are getting a lot of feedback. But uh, I want to actually cover one topic, which is uh, so you have prepared for that. Uh, you have seen movie Pathan. You have seen movie. I think you have seen the Kashmir file as well. Yes, yes. Okay. Love them both. <laughs> I love them both. Um, what's your view? Let's get uh, started. Oh, they're both fantastic films. <laughs> I saw them in Australia. But also better, RRR better than here in Australia. better than your uh, Hollywood movies. <laughs> I, I, I don't think I've seen any Hollywood movies in the theater this year. I think uh, last year, I think it's all been Indian films for me. Really? Uh, look, Hollywood has been in uh, serious decline <laughs> for the last five years. And if you want to see a fun action movie, uh, you you go actually, see. Actually, you're not the first person. Actually, they are saying on Netflix, the number of Indian content are being used worldwide. Uh, they got statistical all information. Right. And I was surprised. How come um, Indian contents are selling so so well everywhere? Well, I mean, Kashmir Files is obviously an, an India-only film. You you have to be Indian, really, to understand uh, Kashmir course. Files. And that was only for domestic it's audiences. Very, it's but, very hard to watch. But RRR well. and Pathan have been breakout hits in the Western world. Uh, they've been seen not only by people in the Indian diaspora, but by Americans. Uh, I mean, American... Uh, media YouTubers have really? gone gaga over RRR, really? and I think they're going to go gaga over Pathan. Pathan was the number three movie in America last weekend. Okay. Number two movie in Australia, number two movie in the United Kingdom. Now, wow. in the UK and Australia, mm. there's substantial Indian diasporas who, you know, probably most of the audience was Indian diaspora, but in the US, the Indian diaspora is not a large enough percentage of the exactly, population yeah. to exactly. make it the number three, and it was very close to being the number two film. It just, wow. it just uh, fell short of um, uh, of beating the uh, oh, what's the cat movie, uh, the, <laughs> <laughs> the Antonio Banderas movie, the Shrek uh, Puss in Boots. It just fell short of Puss, Puss in Boots. Uh, of course, Avatar beat uh, Pathan in all of these markets but well, you know, when, when when an indian movie is second only to avatar in the english speaking world yes. and the movie's not even dubbed into english it's in hindi uh, yes. i think yes. that's really impressive it's just yes. a spectacle and hollywood doesn't want to do spectacle uh, in 2022 there was really only one feel good action spectacular that was not ironic not trying to deconstruct culture that was simply a you know, feel good, rah, rah, be patriotic, enjoy the film movie. And that was uh, Tom Cruise's Top Gun remake. And other than Tom Cruise back, I think that was February, a whole year ago, since then, there's been nothing coming out of Hollywood that is just a feel good action spectacle where you can love the hero, where the hero and the heroine love each other, <laughs> where there's a, a happy ending. These sort of things are absent from Hollywood. And if we need to look to Bollywood and Tollywood to get these, well, that's where we'll go. Wow. Now, sir, you want to ask any question? Uh, uh, so tell you that. Thanks for having you in the program. Uh, can I just go back to the discussion we had earlier? You said American perception about India is based on media, especially New York Times and so forth. But I would also like to ask that okay, if you go back and see, a lot of uh, big American companies have um, Indian CEOs. Okay? So, and also there's a big um, uh, Indian diaspora in America. Right. It's been happening since the last 60s. Okay? So there's huge numbers now, and they're very professional people, like they have a good profile. So do you think all of that okay, are to India's image? I think it has very little to do with India's image because Americans don't particularly see uh, Indian Americans as being particularly representative of India. 
uh, in America, we're very conscious of race, and so you're all aware of you know the Black Lives Matters campaign, and we're all aware of issues around uh, racial minorities in the United States. But Indian Americans, I think, are simply seen as a minority group in the U.S. They're not seen as being emblematic of India. So if you want to know about India, you don't go to the CEO of Google or, or your top executives at, at Microsoft. Uh, you really go to the coverage in the main newspapers. Uh, we, we don't see high-level Indian American corporate leaders speaking as ambassadors for India. If anything, they want to be seen as being entirely 100% American. <laughs> well, there we go. <laughs> um, but this is right. I think um, they, they are there for American cause, American company and all that. But they're nothing, uh, I think it's their, they show their integrity for the country and for the company. But I think the question was uh, how it being perceived. But people. I don't think Americans perceive them as Indian. Uh, uh, you know, remember, oh, America. Yeah. Okay. Uh, this uh, America is not Australia. I, I, in America, anyone can go to the U.S. barely speak English, and simply say, "I love America," and they're accepted as American. There, there's no. It, ah. It's not like Australia, where if you are Indian Australian, you may be socially excluded due to your Indianness. You're not accepted, maybe in the top institutions in Australia. <laughs> you know, Australia is much more of a multicultural society. Yeah, where, yes. you know, we're, we're here on Hindi language radio in India, uh, America. Ugh. Australia does a lot to support multiculturalism in Australia, but it doesn't really integrate uh, ethnic minorities. It takes several generations for ethnic minorities in Australia to become integrated into the mainstream of, of Australian society. In the United States, that integration is instant. Uh, you know, even wow. look, look at someone like, let, let's take it out of the Indian perspective. Think of Elon Musk. Now, e Elon Musk yeah. is South African yeah, by yeah. birth. You'd never know it. I mean, he's American. He's American as can be. Uh, no, he can't run for president because he wasn't born in the United States. But other than that, no one thinks of him as an ambassador for South African business in the United States. He's, he's simply American. Yeah. And that's true. The same, you know, Indian, Indians may be very proud of the success of Indian American business people. But those Indian American business people in the United States are simply viewed as American business people. Wow. Uh, you would have followed that Nikki Haley has actually um, put up her hand to mm -hmm. challenge Mr. Trump for Republican nomination. Yes, like yes, of and course. And she's the daughter of uh, Indian immigrants. Like yes, yes. In the name, like Kamala like Harris the is the daughter of yeah, Indian yeah. immigrants. That's when was right. last yeah, time yeah. she talked about being Indian? Uh, yeah. you know, it's it's it, good learning today. Yeah. Uh, I never actually thought uh, that way at all, but this, you are so right. You're so right. Now, coming back to the movies again. Oh, Pathan. <laughs> it was so much fun. Yeah. So, um, what do you like most about it? What do you like? Art, the song. You know, the Indian movies are a bit different than American. Music is one of the I, big part of our uh, movies. I, I, I think a movie like Pathan is just more than American. <laughs> it's everything you see in an American movie uh, times 15. It, it's just really over the top from an American wow. standpoint. Wow. But what I, what I found really, there, there are two things, uh, two separate things. First, what I enjoyed about the movie was the spectacle. It was just a lot of fun. But what I, what interested me in the movie as a sociologist, as an academic, was what it says about Indian society. Uh, I mean, we hear so much about communal divisions in India yet we see so little evidence that there actually are communal divisions in India. So here we have a movie, Pathan, uh, with a uh, Muslim lead action hero playing a Muslim Indian in the movie, uh, and yet it is the most patriotic movie imaginable. And I don't think, I mean, I know there have been some criticisms on Indian Twitter and around the internet, but I don't think ordinary Indians see this as anything other than a super patriotic movie. And, and the idea that a, a Muslim Indian can be the patriotic lead of a patriotic movie and at the very last moment in the movie kill the bad guy and say, Jai Hind. <laughs> uh, you, you, this, this is simply accepted. And I think that says a lot about Indian society. We hear so much so about communal tension. If, we see so little evidence of so communal let me tension put that, let me India. give you the perspective of that Indian Twitter and what sure. is happening here. So few few things uh, which make a big decision out of it. Number one, uh, the way it's being perceived in um, in India at least and in Indian diaspora as well, anywhere in the world. That the way Bollywood uh, was uh, trying to demonize um, one religion or another, they're trying to make um, uh, Pakistani ISI um, 
so good for you. And even though ISI is creating havoc in India, creating havoc in India, they are doing so brutal thing, killing innocent people, and they mm-hmm. are behind it. Um, I think it is a very well known fact as well that IS, ISI of Pakistan is funding Khalistani movement worldwide. Sure. They are also funding um, a leftist movement sure. uh, in uh, in India. And this is how the nexus is. China is, uh, this is again uh, mm-hmm. what I've been perceived. I cannot support with my fact that China is funding ISI. Though Pakistan directly is... Directly or indirectly, one yeah, way or another. Pakistan yeah. does not have money. They are bankrupt yeah, almost. Yeah. So they are getting money directly from uh, China to ISI. ISI is funding all this thing. Like we had a very good um, uh, uh, farm reform, uh, yeah. farmer reform bill in, in India last year. Yeah. And they were funded like I wrote that. on it extensively, yeah. And so good, they were good for everyone, but government has to withdraw. So these are the havoc is being created and people do not like that um, so what they think is, if suppose I'm buying a ticket today, this money which I'm paying, suppose we are paying 100 rupees to buy a ticket. It is not 100 rupees, actually mm-hmm. it's more than that. And part of that money is going to fund ISI cause. This is where the whole problem is. Yeah, I, I, think, that's, I think that's a real exaggeration uh, and, and probably not even an exaggeration. I don't even think there's a real kernel of truth in there at all about funding the ISI. Look, the, if you watch Pathan, the ISI is not portrayed in a sympathetic light. It is a rogue ISI agent, the love interest, who comes to realize that uh, Pakistan is doing wrong in the world. And when it comes to the point that Pakistan is going to launch a nuclear uh, nuclear terrorism on India, she balks at that and she says, this is not this is not how I want to fight India. So she's portrayed as fighting India, but she's portrayed as having a conscience. And of course, she's the love interest and we have to have this. And look, this, this is a trope that goes all the way back to 1960s Hollywood. If you watch James Bond movies, there's always the you know, the, the, the <laughs> low level, the, 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 a, the KGB agent yeah. uh, who, you know, who help, who's secretly friends with James Bond and helps him <laughs> along. Uh, and that doesn't mean that it's an endorsement of the KGB in of the course, case of James Bond. It doesn't mean it's an endorsement of, of the ISI of course, of course. in the case but of I, this. But I'm talking about film. Italy. But it does humanize yeah, exactly. people. So, it, and, and, and I want to be clear about that. There is a humanization of the enemy yeah. in this movie. And I think the best art does tend to humanize the enemy. It doesn't say the enemy's right and you should love the enemy. It says, you know what, the enemy is human too. And it's really important to persuade your enemy of the righteousness of your cause. That's more important ultimately than just killing your enemies because you can't kill your way course, to peace. Of, of you, you have to persuade your way oh, to sir, peace. I, but, I agree with you. This is a very good point. Yeah. I, I don't think the movie, and uh, look, I can't speak for Bollywood in general. What, what do you, you, can you talk about a bit of the Kashmir file as well? Looks like you have watched it. Oh, sure. The Kashmir Files is, is a fantastic movie. People should go see it if they haven't already. Uh, but again, what the Kashmir Files tells us is much more about society than about the movie. I mean, it's a good movie. Uh, if, I, if I'm going to you criticize it... You this movie is based on the facts? Yes, absolutely. It's a factual movie. Now, now if I'm going to criticize the it's movie... It's more like a, a documentary than the movie itself. Well, yes and no. I mean, if I'm going to criticize the movie from as a piece of art, that is, a, as a film, uh, it, it went, I think, too far in portraying horrors that occurred in Kashmir. The horrors occurred. The, you know, the, the terrible crimes occurred. Actually, but you have a choice in a movie. Do you okay, so again, that's portray them I, graphically or do you... That's what I, I understand. But um, sure. so people that, are saying it's only maybe 25% of what has actually happened. Oh, no, no, no. Look, the Kashmir Files uh, uh, recounts actual factual uh, events in Kashmir, it compresses them in time. So movies always do this. You have to get things in a short period of time. And it takes several atrocities committed by Kashmiri separatist terrorists and collapses them into a single person doing all of them instead of different people doing them. It collapses them to happen all at the same time instead of happening over a period of years. Uh, But nonetheless, the the atrocities were real. My my only complaint with the movie is that it turned my stomach. That that Look, I didn't want to see. uh, Exactly. uh, I, I would rather these these, these was, were um, uh, hinted at instead of shown. But until the last uh, three minutes of the movie, I was <laughs> I was very happy with the film. The last three minutes, I think, were yeah, were was, too much was, for a family. No, no, I, I totally. To see. It's not for everyone um, to really. But that said, th- what I'm really interested in in the movie as a sociologist yeah. is the way that it is 
speaking directly to society, the way in which Indians are telling their own history instead of having their history told for them or manufactured <laughs> for them by a very narrow elite. Exactly. And to me, that's a very positive development for India, that society, whether it's you know, Mr. Agnihorthy and, and film yeah. directors getting involved or ordinary viewers or people on Twitter coming to terms with their own history mm -hmm. instead of simply accepting the sanitized history mm -hmm. that has been taught to them in, let's face it, often a, a Marxist-inspired, almost always a, a secular uh, narrative that's been taught for years in Indian schools and universities. And, and you want to say something about RRR? As well, oh. Oh, RR is just a lot of fun. But I, I, I thought it was interesting. So there, there, a, a, an eminent British historian, Robert Toombs, wrote a uh, an angry review of the movie, uh, pointing out that British colonialism, you know, never embraced slavery <laughs> in India, never was so vicious. And, and I thought it was kind of funny that he was upset to see Britain portrayed in such an ahistorically negative light. And let's face it, the things, I mean, in, in British India, there were many crimes in British India, much worse crimes than portrayed in RRR. I mean, there was the Bengal famine. Yeah. You know, so there were terrible crimes. But no viceroy's wife in, uh, in British India ever pulled out her uh, whip, her whip studded with uh, nails and said, Use my whip. <laughs> so, of course, but I thought it was funny that, that Robert Toombs was so viscerally upset by the movie when we all know as audiences that this is fiction. Right? We, we all know, know that I these know, things didn't course, happen. Course, uh, but it really uh, got it really got to him, yeah. and it got to a lot of British critics that, well, how can you say this about Britain? And well, this is not a documentary. This is <laughs> this is entertainment. That's not, and it's, it's very, entertainment. But it is very interesting for Americans. But I think. this was selected uh, by American. Well, RR yeah. became very popular in the United States, and uh, oh, Americans okay. were, uh, you know, non-Indian American audiences, I think, were surprised, you know, what does India have against Britain? And it actually started this conversation okay. on the American internet, because remember, most Americans are, are only vaguely aware of British colonialism in India, and if they know one thing, and I guarantee you, if Americans know one thing about British colonialism in India, it's, oh, Britain built the railways. <laughs> that's that's it, and, and and so to have a more to to for Americans to come to the realization that uh, colonialism wasn't all about building railways, you know, that even if it were, those railways were built by Indians anyway. <laughs> and and <laughs> so, this, the the whole purpose was, I think, Doctor, we can uh, uh, support me on that. How quickly they can take the wealth from India. To. Or move troops around India. I yeah, mean, you know, railroads yeah, are a tool yeah, of empire, yeah, yeah. but that's uh, but but you know what what RRR did was it it portrayed for Americans the first time yeah. uh, what why are Indians you know how do Indians feel about British colonialism and of course Americans know that these were fictionalized these things didn't actually movie audiences so, are Jerry, much more uh, sophisticated than we give them before we go for. to break I want to give you this question then we can you can answer that. And please go, don't get offended as American. <laughs> American think they are the universe. They they are, and the, the other are because when I Absolutely. went to America, we're very much like Indians that way. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they say aliens. If you go, so they don't call foreigners; they call aliens. So this question for the uh, yeah, after yeah. the break, we will uh, do that. Salvatore, as the question you asked, I can me pucha tha. कि जो अमेरिका ने पूरी दुनिया को एलियन समझते हैं ऐसा क्या है? So why people are uh, American people? They think uh, everybody in the world are aliens. Oh, alien is just a term. The, the, the word alien for foreigner predates the use of alien for people from space. <laughs> so, the word, so it's just an old-fashioned word. Uh, An alien is just someone who's not a citizen of the country. I don't think there's anything I, I, problematic <laughs> about that. Uh, but look, America is a very large country, and it's not only large, but it's the center of, uh, frankly, it's the center of the world's media universe. And when you're in the center, you don't see the peripheries. Uh, for me, as a comparative sociologist, it was an incredible learning experience to live outside the United States, even living in a country as similar to the United States as Australia, it really broadened my horizons. And, and I was someone who studied 
foreign, quote unquote, countries for a living in the United States. Yet even for me, it was really a mind expanding experience coming to live in Australia, because instead of seeing the world from within the United States bubble, I, I can now see the world from outside the United States bubble, looking back into it. And it's a very different perspective. Yeah, I have a lot of so, uh, friends in the U.S. And when I speak to them regularly, they said, okay, the world started East Coast and finished in the West Coast. <laughs> <laughs> no, so America, we have a number yeah. of questions now. Yeah. Um, yeah, now I'd just like to ask you, uh, 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 um, we are Professor Salvatore Pabone, who is in our program, we are also connected with us. Dr. Um, uh, um, Professor Pabon, uh, just uh, about the India Century Roundtable, we just right. like to hear a bit more about this. Okay? Um, what can we expect from this in future? The Indian Central Roundtable is just incorporated in December, so we're still in a startup phase. We're looking for members. Anyone who has $10,000 and would like to, <laughs> to join us, please do. I'm sorry for the high, hefty price, but information doesn't come cheap. Uh, we will be producing research on India starting in March, but hopefully once we're up fully operational every two months, we'll be coming out with a major research report about India. Uh, again focused on India, but facing the West. The reports will be written and not for an Indian audience, but written for a Western audience to explain India to the West. And it's called the Indian Century Roundtable because we'll also be holding roundtables, primarily for journalists, uh, first in Australia, but then hopefully in the United States as well, to educate journalists about what really happens in India. We'd like to get prominent people who have serious on the ground uh, on the ground experience of India to educate Western journalists about India, and that's maybe our most important objective is to educate wow. journalists. Because remember, journalists have to write stories on very short time frames. A journalist that covers uh, the visit of a Japanese prime minister one week has to cover the visit of an Indian prime minister the next week. And that journalist doesn't necessarily have the expertise to cover all of these countries. That journalist needs support. What we'll be doing is providing that support, not only with our research, but also with a Rolodex of people the journalists can call if the journalist needs informed commentary on India. Well, we'll offer the commentary, but we'll also offer connections to well-informed people who can present an unbiased view about India. So is it based in Australia? Or is it like yes, we're here in Sydney. Yeah. We're an Australian, yeah. Australian not-for-profit corporation. To be clear, I'm donating my time pro bono. Uh, my associate director, Pranav Agarwal, is donating his time pro bono. Our accountant is pro bono. Our <laughs> website development is pro bono. None of us are making any money off this. We simply need to raise funds in order to start operating as a business. And so you'll, you'll hear us making the pitch in the Indian Australian community. But we're also looking to uh, major Australian corporate for funding, and we're hoping to be, like I said, fully operational by the new fiscal year, so by July 1st. Salatori, so, I have one question. Uh, primarily, uh, we believe, I mean, we have seen Modi coming uh, to in uh, Australia. We have seen the media coverage of Modi going to uh, U.S. and all that. So, I mean, I understand the um force behind all this that how to manage the media because uh, people um, opinion uh, has to be formed out of what they read or what they watch so uh, we believe that uh, modi himself is doing a lot of good work in terms of managing the media uh, what more this round table can do uh, uh, do you have access to Indian government through consulates and all that uh, and get some buy-in from them because it is in uh, interest of them and also all of us uh, because if I I Indians image abroad is built up then it benefits all the Indian diaspora be in Australia or uh, in US. Look, we, we have no direct connections to government and certainly no funding from governments, whether Indian or Australian, or for that matter, American. Uh, the goal here is to be a civil society organization. Now, the Indian government is very aggressive about managing its uh, public relations, but forgive me, I don't think it's very good at managing its public relations or its public image, certainly not in the Western world. Uh, Indian government, and especially, you know, I'm a big fan of 
Dr. Jai Shankar, but Dr. Jai Shankar, the foreign minister, is very assertive and aggressive in his uh, foreign statements that may play well back in India, but it doesn't really convince Western publics. It certainly doesn't play well with Western journalists. Uh, so I don't think the Indian government has done a very good job of making India's case in the rest of the world. They've done a very good job in making Indians feel that their case is being represented robustly in the world. That's not quite the same thing. Now, what we'd like to do with the roundtable, we're not a public relations firm for India. I just want to get the facts out. Knowledge of India is so low that any kind of opinion will substitute for the real facts when there are no facts available. What we want to do is make the facts available to a wider audience, but especially to Western journalists in a credible way that is not a public relations effort. Personally, I'm confident that if the truth about India were known, that would be a dramatic improvement in India's image totally in agree. the West. All we need is to get the truth out. We don't yes, need sir. to engage in a public relations effort. Yeah, so that's very interesting take because whatever you have said today uh, really is an eye opener. So because when we think that uh, Modi is building uh, image overseas, we because basically it's a human nature that we always want to see what you want to see. So uh, in that line, I've got a question from one of the listeners that. Uh, how can we systematically manage the negative image pursued by the world media against us? You can't manage the negative image. You can only overwhelm it with a accurate image. Uh, so, okay. it, it, look, most, most Americans, if they have any view of India, and not just Americans, Australians, because Australian newspapers republish U.S. newspapers, if they have any opinion of India, it comes primarily from two people. Uh, the Washington Post regularly publishes Rana Ayub. Rana Ayub, uh, her views get in from the Washington Post into the Sydney Morning Herald because the Sydney Morning Herald republishes material from the Washington Post. And then you have uh, Sanadan Dume. Dume writes for the Wall Street Journal and the Wall Street Journal then gets reprinted in the Australian. So whether it's the US <laughs> or Australia, the primary views of, on India come from these two columnists. Now, these two columnists both have very strong political positions of their own. Uh, Ayub, I know, is Indian. Dume, I, I don't know if he's Indian or if he's become an American citizen, but of course he's Indian yes. born. So both of them are, have very biased, very blinkered views on India that come from their own political standpoints. Now, I want to emphasize there's nothing wrong with that, that people should have views about their own country. The problem is that the rest of us primarily understand India through the viewpoints of two highly opinionated columnists whose opinions don't represent majority opinion in India and whose opinions don't represent a factual narrative on India. Yet that's where we get the information from. Yeah. Uh, if you search India, uh, or certainly if you search Narendra Modi, or if you search things like, is India a democracy on the Wall Street Journal website or the Washington Post website, you will almost exclusively get the opinions of these two people. And that's a problem for India. What we want to do with the round table is have a factual narrative about India. So when people search these things, they'll get our factual narrative. But almost more importantly, so that when journalists at the Washington Post and the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times, not opinion authors, when journalists want to get factual information about India, they can come to us for a fact instead of going to Rana you for an opinion. Yeah. Actually, may, I, uh, may I just quickly ask you, uh, in this stone age, you think print media has such a big influence that, that two people like it yeah. can have such a big negative image? It has an enormous influence because print media is where television media gets its information. Uh, television media almost, almost never does original, almost never is too strong. It rarely does original reporting. The, only if they have a news magazine program, like 60 Minutes, you, you, they'll do original reporting. But most television reporting, especially in the 24-hour news stations, is they've read the newspaper in the morning and they follow up on the stories. That is, they pick the narrative out of the newspapers. Mm -hmm. um, some television news, the BBC in particular, does that explicitly. They, they even have a program that is reading the newspaper papers in, yes. in the morning. Uh, the, the print media drive the agenda on this. When you Google a question, that comes up and the, the answer comes up in the print media. And not just okay. for television, but for example, if you want to know something on Wikipedia, you refer back not to a TV segment that may have been posted on YouTube. The reference is almost always 
a print media source. We're always going back to the print media as the authoritative opinion on which other opinions are drawn. So it would be good a few questions if I may ask you on behalf of our listeners. Um, Sudhir uh, Rana asked, if the last monarch of independent JNK signed the secession of whole JNK to India, why is Kashmir not in India? Kashmir, Ka- Kashmir is in India, and I, I, I first of all, I'm not whole, an international whole, lawyer. Uh, look, my my reasonably firm understanding is that in international law, uh, Kashmir is rightfully to be administered by India, while a referendum is yeah. uh, while a referendum is scheduled for some time in the future. Now, it was Pakistan that forestalled that referendum by invading Kashmir <laughs> just a, just a, 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 what, six weeks after the uh, independence, independence of India yeah. and Pakistan. So it was Pakistan that put paid to the referendum by resorting to force and invading. Kashmir, and then of course Pakistan illegally transferred a portion of Kashmir uh, to uh, China. Uh, so that again is is an illegal transfer, not recognized in international law. Of course, all of Jammu and Kashmir should, uh, by rights, be part of India. The fact is that, uh, and I'm sorry to break it to everyone, the fact is that it's never again going to be. Uh, which is to say, the line of control is going to become, at some point in the future, some kind of international border. That's inevitable. But I also want to remind Indians, whether this is a historical wrong or not, well, let's just say, despite the fact that this is a historical wrong, uh, the question you might ask yourself is, at this point, 75 years later, would Indians want to regain control over Pakistan-occupied Kashmir? I really <laughs> doubt it. Uh, yes, it may be India's by right, but do you want it? And if you don't want it, well, then let's see movement towards peace instead of standing on principle. Um, if I may just make a comment, this issue is not about actually Jammu Kashmir, in my opinion. It is about justifying having this army, big army in Pakistan. Army control everything. Yes. They, they eat up a lot of budget of uh, Pakistan people and and they will never have this issue sorted. Because once this issue is sorted, you don't need army. And this is not acceptable. Pakistan has been a 75 year running tragedy. And, yeah. and that's just a <laughs> fact of life. And it's a fact of life for Pakistanis even more uh, than for their neighbors. Uh, military rule in Pakistan has always been a fact of life. Uh, it is something that hopefully Pakistanis want to move away from. Uh, we'll see if they're able to. It's it's a difficult challenge. They do not have good relationship anybody. N- none of their neighbors. So Iran, no. Afghanistan, no. Right. India, India of no. course not. And China now at the moment they have now trying to delink themselves as soon as possible. So the problem is because dishonesty is one of the main theme they have. No matter what happens, the lie got to prevail. And, and you are the person who was working on the truth part. Look, pa- Pakistan and Bangladesh, you know, originally East Pakistan, uh, Pakistan and Bangladesh were, were born in violence. Uh, yeah. They really derived from, right. not just from partition, for, but from Direct Action Day in 1946 that ultimately led to uh, the partition of British India into India and Pakistan. Unfortunately, they have never gotten over that violence. Now, now Pac- Bangladesh, by becoming independent from Pakistan, started a process of getting over that violence. And although there still is uh, you know, some degree of ethnic cleansing of Hindus in Bangladesh going on, it's at a relatively low level. Bangladesh internationally has made peace with India and it's been broadly speaking friendly to India since then and has had friendly relations. And so Pakistan maybe offers, a, I'm sorry, Bangladesh maybe offers a model for what could happen exactly. in Pakistan. We all say, oh, Pakistan will never heal itself, will never solve its problems. But I remind people that the, the original, the, the, the worst violence in 1946 that ultimately convinced the British that they couldn't stay in India, that violence happened in Calcutta and in uh, the rural areas north of Dhaka. That violence happened in old Bengal. Uh, and Bengal was the center of violence in 1946 and early 1947 that convinced the British to leave India. And yet now the Bangladesh-India frontier, the Bangladesh-India border has now been, been internationally recognized, 
is largely peaceful. I know there are refugee issues. I know there are problems, but there are low-level manageable problems, and that has largely been solved. Well, you know, can Pakistan become the next Bangladesh? I, I see no reason why it can't. Well, uh, we all uh, hope it will. <laughs> hope it will. Um, so, Dr. we will have uh, some more question um, uh, from the uh, our listener as well. But what you would like to add more uh, uh, to our audience? What you would like to share as well, if you can. I'd like to share a message of hope. I, 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 look, I'm very positive on India and Indian society. That should be clear from my writings. And I don't take any side on this. I, I mean, again, I always want to be clear. If I'm saying something, it's not because I'm taking the side of Narendra Modi or the BJP, or I'm taking the side of the INC or taking you know, Arvind Kedrawal's side. I have no side in Indian politics. I'm just reporting on India for the West. I'm doing research on India. And my research has been consistently showing that India is a more peaceful, more tolerant, uh, better settled country than anyone wants to believe. Everyone wants to make out as if India is perpetually in crisis. And when I say everyone, I don't just mean people who are opposed to the current government. I mean people who are aligned with the current government also want to make out as if there's a crisis. I mean, I was on one interview where the interviewer kept trying to uh, push the idea that there was a genocide of Hindus about to occur in India. And I said, really? I said, do you think Narendra Modi will win the 2014 election? She said, oh, absolutely. I said, 2024 election? She said, absolutely. I said, and do you think that there will be a genocide of Hindus while Narendra Modi is the prime minister? And she said, yes. And I said, I, look, I just don't think that's yeah, possible. No. <laughs> you know. Uh, so I think on both sides, there's elevated rhetoric that doesn't match the reality of India. All of our survey data on India show that Indian Muslims believe that they are free to practice their religion in India and face relatively little discrimination. All of our survey research shows that Hindus, that Christians, that Buddhists, that Sikhs, and that Parsis feel they're free to practice their religion in India and face relatively little discrimination. That's what systematic survey research shows. Now, of course, the press is much more interested in intercommunal <laughs> disharmony, but the survey research shows that people simply get along. Democracy works. People have rights and freedoms, they enjoy them, and they're happy with their government. Actually, if I, I can one, add um, one question on a please. personal level. Yes. Before you went to India, you may have had certain perceptions, okay? So what can you relate to your visit to India as compared to your own conceptions when you acted before you had gone there? Well, look, my November visit to India was at the invitation of India today, and I have an upcoming visit uh, next week to India, which is... Uh, a, as a guest of uh, Z Media and the Art Festival. Uh, I'm very happy to visit India. I'm very happy to learn while I'm there. But the fact is, all of my academic work on India derives completely from documentary evidence and hard data about India. Whenever I see something personally, I do my best to forget it because my personal experiences can't possibly represent India. Now, not only my personal experiences, even your personal experiences, those of you who were born and raised in India, your personal experiences can't stand for India. Why? Because India is a country of 1.4 billion people. <laughs> uh, I mean, how can your person, all of you, yeah. none of you yeah. speak all of the major languages of India. It, it would take a, a true <laughs> polymath just to speak all of the major languages of India, never mind the minor languages. So if you don't even speak the languages yeah. in your own country, how can you say that you know India? So, so I won't pretend to know India, but I will constantly question, do you really know India? Or do you know a small slice of India that is your personal experience and you generalize it? And I think that's the problem with columnists like, like Rana Ayub, like Sanan Adume. They're taking their own personal experience in the one case of being a young Indian Muslim woman who's a political activist. And of course, if you're a young Muslim woman political activist, you're going to have a very different experience from the average Indian. Same thing with Dume. If you're an elite, if you're an, an elite, highly educated uh, NRI at an American think tank, your experience of India is going to be very different from the average experience. That's why we go to survey research. Yeah. Because survey research tells us what the average people person thinks, not what an individual thinks. In case of, if I can add, uh, in Hinduism, we believe that you can worship God whatever way you want to. There's no one way. And so what it means, 
say uh, any Christian or Muslim, they are worshipping their own way. They are doing the same thing. There is nothing called one way. So we can have any faith. In one family, you might have four brothers. They are worshipping totally different way. They are worshipping different God. So there is nothing wrong about it. And that's why we have freedom of uh, religion, true freedom of religion in India. This is, so I'm, I'm glad you feel that way. Of course, many people disagree with you and many people feel like you have to worship the one true way. But I want to be clear to Indians and especially to Hindu Indians who may be listening. Our survey research tells us that more than 90% of Indian Muslims, more than 90% agree with this statement, you can only be truly Indian if you respect other people's religions. Yes. Sir. Okay. So, yes, you know, there are some very shrill Muslim Indians who might say that there's only one true religion and all others you know, are, can't be accepted. But, but the majority Muslim opinion, and not a small majority, over 90% majority opinion among Muslims, again, among Muslims, among Hindus, among Buddhists, among all groups in India, they agree with the statement, you can only be truly Indian if you respect other people's okay. rights to worship as they see fit. Right. 